counsel the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This morning I'm not going to so much spend time on the last two verses dealing with the final destinies. They're pretty clear enough. There is a heart of this that I want to deal with, but it has much to do with the songs we've been singing and even just the journey we've been taking through Mark. And it's it's simply that, I, you know, going through the Gospel of Mark, I try to just let the text speak for itself. Uh, your life has to interact with it, so there is some, some, somewhat of a subjective element because if it doesn't change your life, then what's the point? Um, but I really tried with Mark and going through the gospel to let the text speak for itself, and even when it came down to just the pragmatics of the outline, not to strain outlines any further, but just to keep it simple because Mark kept it simple. And... <clears throat> I come to Psalms, and I, I want to spend time in Psalm 1, but it's sort of just a, a launching pad in so many ways, and it's an appropriate psalm because it is a launching pad. But, you know, thinking about the songs you're singing today, the, the, the Reformation was so crucial. There were the five solas, and they were important. Sola fide. We hold to justification by faith alone. Yes? That was crucial. Uh, unfortunately, we find many in the church today in evangelicalism who really don't care. And actually, more and more, we find that the evangelical church is moving more towards a works-oriented righteousness. They may say the word sola fide, but in practice, it's not so. And especially in how ministry is conducted. One of the others is sola gratia. This is solely grace, right? We have been saved by grace, right? Alone. Through faith, alone. And these were crucial elements that in the Reformation they fought for. Another one that was so crucial was sola scriptura. And there are many in the evangelical church who would say, yeah, absolutely, it is the sole rule of faith and practice. But the reality of it is, is that when it comes down to practice, and I would say even belief, it is not so. It's just not so. There is this growing sense of the Word of God is not sufficient enough for our lives. I remember years ago, when I was much younger, I remember in a church meeting and a man said that the Word of God is not sufficient for the church today because the church today is too complex. Seriously. And it stunned me when he said that. And then this was a leader in the church saying this in, in a church meeting. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. But here's the crazy thing. More and more are saying that today. You see, with all of our cell phones and our TVs and all the gadgets, the more that we excel as human beings and the more ingenious we become with all of these things, all of a sudden God isn't enough, His Word isn't enough, it's not sufficient. There has to be something far more technical out there and obviously the world then must have the answer. So we have now psychology being mixed in with the Word of God. And it's more like not 50-50 or 60-40. It's 90% world and 10% word, if that much. So I often, for myself, bring myself back to Psalm 1 to, to refocus myself and where things really are. 
and especially in regards to this world. And I'll just read for you a, a statement. I don't do this often, but I'll do this here. James Boyce, trying to capture the sense of sola scriptura, he says this, when they, talking about the reformers, when they used these words, the reformers were indicating their concern for the Bible's authority. And what they meant to say was that the Bible alone is our ultimate authority. I'll just tell you this morning, I absolutely believe that. Absolutely. Without a doubt. I will live and die on that statement right there. Not the Pope, not the church, not the traditions of the church or the church councils, still less personal intimations or subjective feelings. <laughs> that is rampant today. It's more of how we feel and less upon what the Word of God says. All of these things, but Scripture only for them. These things, these other sources of authority are sometimes useful and may at times have place, but Scripture alone is ultimate. Therefore, if any of these other authorities differ from Scripture, they are to be subjected by the Bible and rejected rather than it being the other way around. So I have always said, and I will say, and I will raise my kids to understand this truth, you read everything in light of Scripture, not Scripture in light of everything else. I believe Genesis 1. And if scientists say anything that contradicts that or undermines that, and I reject every word that they say, I believe that. I will live by that. I believe in the sufficiency of the Word of God, and I take you to Psalm 1 to talk about the Word of God because there is a need for us to be discriminating. Uh, we don't like the use of that word, especially today. Discrimination is not a good term. It's a good term for us as believers. I was in a discussion with a Jehovah's Witness, and he was telling me, you're closed-minded. I said, no, I'm discerning and discriminating. Difference. Huge difference. That means I'm not going to drink everything that you give to me. We need to be discriminating in our life. Here's what happens sometimes, and I believe Satan is behind it. The demons are behind it. We have doctrines of demons. We know the influences there. Oftentimes, Satan will give a little bit of truth and a whole bunch of hogwash. He'll give us a little bit of truth so that we will buy that truth, but we'll take everything else along with it. And oftentimes we're too lazy to be discerning to take that truth and push all the falsehood to the side. The other thing that he likes to do is give us a bunch of hogwash with a little bit of truth. You say, well, you're saying the same thing. No, not really. Because what he'll do is he'll give us the hogwash. He'll make it so clear it's hogwash that we'll take that hogwash and cast it aside. But what we'll do is we'll cast that truth right alongside of it. He is very deceptive, he is very scheming, he is very manipulating, and we have to be discerning in life. And the thing I like about Psalms 1 is it just gets down to the basics. There are two paths, and there are two kinds of people, and there are two destinies. Knock and yet, that's it. That's all. And I love that about Psalms 1 because it really then narrows life down. I don't like complexity. There are so many roads and options. You know, when we get on the freeway and we're going down to Southern California, I know you get on the five and you drive till you get there. Right? Whatever you do, don't get off in Sacramento because they do not want any people passing by coming through. But you just get on the five and drive. It's the great thing about it. But see, the reality of it is there's a whole lot of exits. There's a whole lot of turnoffs. There's a whole lot of vistas. A lot of points where you can stop and take a view and look around. There's a lot of places in which all of a sudden you can get off track, and it's the same with life. And Psalms 1 is a great way of bringing us back to, look, there is a polarity in life. There are just two ways. There are two destinies. There are two kinds of people. Which one are you? And you always have to remember this because it helps us to be discriminating. And notice the discrimination that runs through here. We have the discriminating way of the godly, verses 1 through 2, and then we have the discriminating way of God, verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Why does he know the way of the righteous? Because they're walking in his way. But the way of the wicked will perish. God is discriminating. Therefore, we must be discriminating. And, and God is going to evaluate and judge everyone in the end. We know this fact. So we better be discriminating in this life. 
We need to disassociate from the wicked and we need to associate with God more. We got to spend less time listening to the world and more time listening to God. Why do we go to the world to diagnose and give us the solution to our problems when God says, I've got it all right here, right here? And I'll say we just need to start with the Word, whatever is going on in our life. Go to the Word, stay in the Word. And I'm not talking about that there are not other issues out there. I'm just telling you the great thing about Psalms 1 is it just narrows all of life down to two elements. And it's very basic. The complexities of life unfold in the rest of the Psalter. We're going to have David deal with all kinds of enemies and all of that stuff. The second psalm is political. We're going to get into all of that stuff, but it's very defining right up front. The reality of it is that God is going to be discriminating. He is going to associate with the godly, and He is going to reject the wicked. We need to be discriminating, but we, we can't be lazy to do that. One of the things I love re about reading Francis Schaeffer is because he can do that. He'll read and he'll deal with the things of the world. He'll find the truth. He'll hang on to the truth and cast everything else aside and say that's falsehood. We need to be able to do that. We need to do that always. Whatever we're watching, whatever we're reading, whether it's entertainment, our minds have to be working. That's usually when our mind shuts off. Usually we turn, by time, day's done, I want to turn on the TV, I want to veg and watch a movie, and we just stop thinking. And that's when Satan just starts filling you up, filling you up, filling you up, filling you up. And we could just knee-jerk reaction. Everyone just get rid of a TV and no one ever watch TV. No one ever listen to the radio. And let's live in caves and forget all about the world. No, no. Just be discriminating. Be thoughtful. Always thoughtful. And we'll see from this psalm, but the mind should never rest. Not even in bed. Not even bed. Our mind must always be going on the things of God. Always. So if I could title this psalm, it is People, Paths, and Ultimate Destinations. And that is the bulk of what is being dealt with here. Man, I will watch the clock. We may not get to everything. All right, a little bit of introduction. I have to do this. This psalm contrasts the, the, the loves for the Torah and the ungodly. And this psalm, by virtue of its vocabulary and the content of what we find in it, we classify this as a wisdom psalm, and there are many of such psalms in the Psalter. I, I love the Psalter. I, I was going to do this, but I, I realized, man, I got too many slides. So I was going to go through the Psalter, but actually, if you look at the Psalter, it's made up of five books. Each book has a doxology at the end. The last one, the fifth one, has a series of doxologies. It's an amazing work. I wish more people who led worship spend more time in psalms. They'd learn a lot about worship. And a lot about exalting the name of God. But every one of these Psalters ends with this great doxology. Amen and amen. It's like this hearty approval of everything we just sang from all of these Psalms all the way through here. But this is a wisdom psalm. The terms that are used and the teaching that it gives is very much like wisdom literature. And, and psalms are often classified this way. It's very much like Proverbs. And this particular psalm establishes the polarity of persons and destinies. And this is the great thing about Proverbs, right? I mean, I love that with the kids. We spent so many years going through Proverbs, and I still do that. And I give them these Proverbs that make them think. You know, that's the great. Proverbs does two things for us. It gives us moral skillfulness and mental acumen. It helps us to think. You want to get your kids' minds working? Give them some Proverbs. There are some serious riddles in there. I gave one to Ian last Sunday. Chapter 24, verses 10 through 12. There is a common link of all three of those Proverbs, and it's a pretty amazing truth. But you make them think. And this is a great thing about this psalm because it is so basic, but it is complex. I mean, the structure is everywhere. But it divides humanity, and it separates them ethically, first of all. All people are divided ethically, and then all people are separated judicially. We have the picture of the godly, then the picture of the ungodly. And, and great pictures were given. The godly, the tree, the ungodly, the chaff. I mean, what more do you got to say about that? Then you have the failure of ungodly people and then the fruition of godly and ungodly lifestyles, verse 6, as it's brought to this culmination. It divides all of humanity into two parts. There are the fools and the wise. There are the righteous, they're the wicked. It's all of life. You see, all of life, wherever I go, I know this basic truth. There's truth and there's lie. I need to discern the truth and I need to reject the lies. How do I discern the truth? Right here. 
right here. I don't need to know more of the lies so that I can say that's a lie. I just need to know the truth, yes? And then everything else, it falls by the wayside when it comes up to the truth. The problem is, if we're not in this enough, we're not delighting in this and loving this and in this and living in it and thinking it and breathing it and meditating it constantly, then we have nothing to weigh everything else by. Well, then we drink it all in and think it's all true. But it's not. The structure of the psalm is distinctively poetical. There's so much parallelism that runs through here, and I won't get exhaustive with all of this. There are chiastic structures that run through here. The simple structure is this, the permanence, the, the permanence of the righteous, the firmly planted tree, the impermanence like the chaff, the wicked, and then the contrast of the righteous and wicked in verse 6. It gets even more complex as you walk through it and you start to see the chiastic structures. There's a final one in verse 6 that you have the verb with the participle, verbal noun. Then you have the verb imperfect and there's antithetical parallelisms. You have the two ways and then adjectives that describe them. The way of the righteous, the way of the wicked. And verse 1 by itself has its own beautiful symmetry. I mean, I could just spend forever le lecturing on the beauty of this particular psalm. I've spent so many years studying this psalm. But it's amazing how it is laid out for us. Do not walk, do not stand, do not sit. And then in nice parallelism we have in the counsel of the wicked, in the way of sinners, and in the seat of scoffers. And we'll walk through these details Overall, this is how I put the psalm, and it's in a chiastic structure. The way of the blessedness, present condition, the way of the perishing future destiny. Steadfastness in the Lord's law, standing, no standing in the Lord's judgment, the permanent tree, and the impermanent chaff. The amazing thing is how this begins and ends. It begins with the blessedness, ashtaray, and it ends with toved, perishing. What a contrast. Right? What a contrast. Begins with blessing, ends with perishing. And many have thought, because it starts with Ashtoreh, which is the, the term blessing, many have thought that Psalm 1 and 2 actually go together. And what's very intriguing is how the, they begin. We have verse 1 of Psalm 1, how blessed, and notice verse 12 of Psalm 2, how blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Sort of forms an inclusio. And there are other points of connection, and I'll leave those for you to discover on your own. That's just a little breadcrumb. But the contrast that is here is staggering. It's very stark. And that's the starkness between truth and lie. Yes? It's just not gray. Why in the... I just said, okay, I'm going to go there, but I, I wasn't going to do it. But I'm going to do it anyway. Why in the world, when we discuss the issue of truth and we talk about evolution and creationism, why do we fall into where the world wants us to go? It's like there's sort of this nether place we can stand and defend that truth from there and then reason back to the Word of God. Here's the problem. If I know evolution is a lie and Romans 1 says it's a lie and the world is bought into the lie, okay? If it is the lie, all right, then it is not truth. Amen? And truth is absolute. It cannot change. You can suppress the truth. I can reject the truth. I can turn my back on it all I want to. I can exchange the truth for life, but I cannot change truth. It is absolute. If I have a building and I look at that building, I can close my eyes to the reality of that building. I can turn my back on it. I can look at that building and say it's a cow, but the truth is it is a building and I can never change that fact. If that is true, then that which is false and that which is a lie is opposite truth, but here's the reality of it. It doesn't matter how much proof or evidence you give to that lie, you cannot change it and make it true. So why do I act like evolution is just another variant idea? It's not. There is truth, there is lie. There's not even a discussion, folks. I should never even debate an unbeliever as though there is another option. Because no matter what proof they give, it's a lie. You can't change it and make it true. But see, we keep handing this stuff over to the world thinking we're trying to reach the lost. Let's accommodate. No. No. We're handing away the one thing, the only thing that can save them, and that is the Word of God. The truth. That's my soapbox, sorry. Psalm 1. So here we are, the reality of the Word of God in the midst of all of this. The blessedness. Ah, oh, I love this. So the blessedness. This is how it begins. 
And, and we have how blessed. And I'm just sorry, but the translation is just blah. Okay? Because first of all, this is plural in the Hebrew. This is an intensification of it. Oh, I put it this way. Oh, the blessednesses of the man. Not only that, but we have anacrusis along top of this. And then we have a double metheg. And you go, what's that? Without getting into all the elements, all right, of Hebrew and all of this stuff, okay? So metheg is a part of the accent system. And, and there's unique accents to the wisdom literature and to the Psalms. The Masoretes developed it to preserve the purity of the reading of the word and the understanding of it. Now, this is an unusual construction to have a double metheg, and it's just a vertical line that goes like this. And normally it's on the second and fourth syllables, but they're put back to back and next to the tone syllable. But this is a different, this is a variant, this is something unique. In other words, we are supposed to read this as exceptional. So you have the double form, the blessednesses of the man. Then you have the double metheg, which actually in Hebrew, metheg means bridle, which you're, the reader is supposed to pause. So there's a double pause. Not only that, but you have an olive with a glottal stop, which is also a pause. So you have this threefold pause. In other words, the, the writer of this wants us to say, stop, look at this. This is amazing! Exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. How blessedness is of the man who does not do this, but does this. It gets our attention. It says, this is who you want to be. This is where you want to be. This is what you want to experience. You want to be this kind of man. This is what's amazing about this psalm. It is the gatekeeper to the Psalter. It sets us on a pathway that we must maintain all the way to the end and finally get to the final psalm. And it's just an all-out hallelujah of all of creation praising God. And that's what we're looking for. Yes, the final day when we all praise God together and forget this place. But this gets us started. Oh, the blessedness is a, of the man. And I want you to stop. I want you to stop and look at this. Because I want you to be challenged by this. I want you to be encouraged and I want you to be challenged to strive to live to the glory of God. This is the kind of person you want to be. And the great thing about this psalm is it tells us how to be this kind of person. In very simple terms. And we want to be this kind of person. We strive after this, this blessedness, this righteous life that is laid out before us. The scriptures is full of, of challenges and exhortations towards us. And this psalm gets us started. The blessedness of this righteous man is described in three ways. First, his character, then his course of life, and then the consummated end. And his character is a result of verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. That's the turning point. The emphasis laid there, Ki'im. But, understand this, this is his delight. We want to be like this guy because this blessedness it evokes joy and gratitude. It is a man who lives in fellowship with his God and with his neighbor. It, it encapsulates everything in the terminology here that the psalmist used indicates that, that we're talking about peace with God and peace with one's neighbor if you're walking in the cords with the law of God. This is not merely just an occasional outward condition. This is a continual internal state. It doesn't matter then whatever your condition is out there. On the outside, on the inside, this is where you rest. You are in the state of blessedness. Man, I want to be there. I want to be there. I want to be there that when no matter what circumstances come, whatever happens in life, I am in the state of blessedness. I took my kids to Romans 5 recently to help them understand the peace of God. And there's a difference. There's peace with God and then there's the peace of God. Romans 5 talks about peace with God. We were sinners, we were enemies, we were haters of God, yes? And then he says, but you have been reconciled. You have peace with God. That is an objective standing. That's not the personal subjective feeling. That is the objective standing. Man, if you understand that standing, then so many other things fall into line. But you've got to understand that state of peacefulness that you have with God because of reconciliation. This is a state of blessedness. And it's not ruffled by anything that comes on the outside. 
the way of blessedness, the present condition, and notice the, the escalation that comes. And he starts off with describing the, the blessed man's life, the righteous man's life. How blessed is the man, verse 1, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. There is this movement, and it's a downward movement. Does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, does not stand in the way of sinners, and does not sit in the seat of scoffers. Several elements that are laid out here, very simply, but very clearly. First, we have three degrees of habit. We have walking, we have standing, and we have sitting. It's a progression in sin. You can see this movement. Yeah, you're heading down this path, right? And then all of a sudden you're just you're standing. There's this sort of this resolve. And then the real resolve comes and you just sit. And you're in the sit in a seat of scoffers. It's those who reject, they mock, they make fun of all that which is holy, all that which is true. Normally when you come across those who are driven against God, you find them. They're the scoffers. They mock, they laugh, they ridicule. Not only that, but we have three degrees of evil. We have the wicked, we have the sinners, and we have the scoffers. The late seem. And then three degrees of openness to evil doing. The counsel, the way, and the seat of the consensus. Listen to me. All we have to do is take one step. One step. And we start heading down a different path. You might ask, well, what does it matter if we compromise in this area to, to reach people? Well, why can't we just hand over this chapter? It's just one chapter. No, because that chapter is connected to that chapter, to that chapter, to that chapter, from this book to that book to that book to that book. All of a sudden, you hit one domino, they all start falling. We keep doing this in the church. Well, what does it matter if we just take one step? Because eventually you stand, and before you know it, you're sitting. You're sitting in the sin of the world, and you're calling yourself one thing, and you're completely something else. And I understand this fact. God is going to discriminate. And God is impartial. And God judges solely by truth and reality. In our own personal lives, don't become an accommodationist. Be watchful. Be discerning. Be discriminating. It's okay. Do not let political correctness take this word from us in the Christian realm when it comes to truth and falsehood. Be discriminating. And we need to call it for what it is. And I, I want my kids to be able to do this in the world. I don't want to hide them from the world. I've never tried to do that for them. I didn't try to indoctrinate them with the world, but at the same time, they have to interact with the world. They have to face it. They have to deal with it. I'm not going to be here forever. I knew that way back when I was getting married to my wife, and I, I encouraged her to go off to school to work on her degree and start moving that way, because if something happens to me, then I want to make sure she's taken care of. I want to make sure they're taken care of. I want to make sure that they are discriminating and discerning and they are looking for that which is true and that which is false. They need to be able to interact with the world. You can't keep them in a bubble forever. I went to Christian school with people who were in a bubble for so long and then they got to college and all of a sudden the restraints are off and they had freedom and they had no idea how to use it. And they became a mess. A mess. And they weren't challenged by the world either because they, they believed these things, but they were so isolated and the world never tested them and never tried them. They were never put to the fire. And therefore, they never had to stand up for their faith. And then all of a sudden, they're being challenged and mom and dad aren't around anymore. We have to allow our kids room to fall. Christ did that with the disciples. Send them out. Fall. Come back. Let me set you straight. But we have to get them ready to face this. But one step, right? Do not turn from the right to the right or to the left. Stay the course. Psalm 1 helps me stay the course in my life. It breaks everything down to its most simplistic forms. 
The threefold description profoundly portrays the totality of the evil. And there's perfect tenses that run all the way through here, which indicates... Now, this is interesting because there are two ne negative particles in Hebrew. The one that's used here is lo. That means absolutely never. So, if I can put it this way, how blessed, though, the blessedness is of the man who never walks in the counsel of the wicked, who never stands in the path of sinners, and who never sits in the seat of scoffers. On top of that neg negative particle saying he never does that, we have perfect tense. And you say, there is no way I'm going to ever do this in my life. Absolutely true. This is a psalm of ideal. This is what we're all striving for. This is what we're all striving for. This is why it's the first psalm. Now look at me. You're going to walk in the rest of the Psalter and you're going to encounter life. The enemies, the physical ailments, all of that stuff is going to come. Stay the course. There's truth and there's lie. Whatever you face in life, there's truth and there's lie. Who are you going to listen to? Who are you going to listen to? Steadfastness in the Lord's law, and this is how he can never do this. He's in the law of the Lord. Behind the act of obedience in verse 1 lies the inward activity of mind and emotions exercised day and night in the word of God. <laughs> I can't. So uh, we were talking with a brother years ago. We were talking about Christian bookstores. And he says, you know, it's a, we walk in a Christian bookstore. And it used to be you walk in and you see all the study tools there, right? Encyclopedias and commentaries and, and language studies and all this stuff, right? And then in the back were like the Christian living stuff, the, the fluff. You can go back there, you know, if you... He says, you watch now, you walk in a Christian bookstore, all the fluff is up front. The study stuff is in the back. So there was a place down on, on Division, I believe that's where it was. And I remember walking in, and they had several rows of critical stuff, study stuff, and then they had the other stuff. Then all of a sudden, it narrowed down to one row. Then it was like one section of the shelves. It's not there. It's not there. It's a telling sign. And I, I'm walking through this bookstore, and... I'm walking through this section, the men's section, right? And, I, and I'm looking at the books that people want to read, I guess. And here's the book, the five-minute spiritual workout for the man of God. Really? Can you call him a man of God with five minutes a day? I don't think so. Not according to this psalm. I don't think so. By day and by night. In other words, this is a marismus. This brackets the entirety of your day. From the moment you get up to the moment you go to bed, and even in bed, you are constantly thinking on the Word of God. That is your meditation. Man, I wish we'd spend more time talking about this diet than other diets. My life. I need to be in the Word of God. I need to be feeding on this all the time. It's such right perspective then when I'm dealing with all the other things that come in life. And we know we have all those other things that come. The political, the physical, the family, the everything, the community, all of that stuff work. All that stuff comes in the Psalter. But I must be set on the right course if I'm going to go out and face all of that stuff. I have to have myself in the right place. It means I have to be in the Word of God. The psalmist says it is his delight. This term delight means to take pleasure and to delight in, to be inclined to. It is one's inner disposition, their heart driven towards this and compelled towards this. This is one's passion. It's set in striking contrast to what has preceded it. He doesn't do these things because this is his delight. And what is the object of the delight? It is the law of the Lord. It is that revelation that God has given us to help man to understand how to live in harmony with his will. It is that delight. It is that desire of him. It is that passion that he has. It is God's revealed will to us. There's no question work in this. Well, how much, So many times we spend in our life trying to figure out Brothers and sisters, and I do this. We sit there going, well, I wonder what the will of God is for my life. I got to start with the written one first. Because I'll tell you what, oftentimes we look at circumstances and think, oh, God's leading me in this way. But if I read this, I realize, no, that's not him leading. <laughs> that's something else working there, and it's not the Lord. 
I've had brothers come to me in the past dealing with jobs and they're discontent with their job. And they say, you know what? I think the Lord's telling me to leave. I said, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but is that the Lord telling you or is that your discontentedness telling you? It's a difference, isn't it? There's a difference. And I'm not saying these things because I don't wrestle with these things. And I tell you, this is why I keep coming back to this psalm, to get my mind straight because I get distracted. I try to find elements and, and solutions to problems and everything else everywhere else but here. In desperation, we start groping. But see, if we set the course and we keep reminding ourselves of that course, right? We just keep coming back to this. It simplifies everything. All the distractions aside, all the difficulties aside, all the things of the world aside. And I have to do this as Psalm 2, man, politics, don't even get me started. I have to just bring myself back to here. It just starts with here. Do I delight in the law of the Lord? Is it my passion? Do I have a hunger for it? Do I thirst for it? Is this the one place I would rather be than all other places? I mean, if you laid 50 books out in front of me, is this the first one I'm going to pick up? If I have a choice between this or the TV or the radio, is this the first thing I'm going to pick up? Is it that thing that just consumes me? I can never lay it down? Psalmist says, no, I meditate on imperfect tense. I am continuously pondering, moaning over, musing over. I'm meditating on these things, thinking them over and over. I like to describe this term in Hebrew. I like to describe this term as like a cow chewing its cud. This is what we do with the Word of God, right? You, you chew on it for a while. You swallow it down, first stomach, a little digestion goes on, back up again, right? And you chew it on for a while, and it goes down, second stomach, back up. This is what meditation is. And this week, I had three things going on in my mind. Wednesday night, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning. Three different, all total different areas. Everything's going. Just constantly thinking. Constantly pondering. Talking to yourself. You ever talk to yourself, the Word of God? You ever just muse over a passage, talk it over in your mind, and then you start saying it audibly? I think my kids hear him talking in the bathroom all the time. <laughs> Who are you talking to, imaginary friends? Do you ever just sit there and talk through a passage? Do you ever talk through a theological concept, a doctrine? There's so many things that are vying for our attention in life. This has to be priority because all the others are just going to become complete distractions that will take us off on the wrong path. All of a sudden, you, we'll realize we're not on the five freeway anymore. We're on some back roads and GPS is not working and I don't know where I'm at. Meditation is characterized as a deep reflective thought, often recurring in repetitive, enduring fashion. This is why it's linked with phrases like day and night, during the watches of the night. Meditation is not setting apart a special time for personal devotion. This is something different. This is whether morning or evening it is, the reflection of the Word of God in the course of daily activities. You are constantly thinking, this is a great thing about the Word of God. When you memorize it, you can take it wherever you go. And then you can think on it. My wife, I, she asked me years ago, what do I do when I study the Bible? I said, you read through a book from beginning to end, several times in one sitting. So she started doing that. So one day we're sitting in our first apartment in Russia, and so she's talking to me about this passage of 1 Peter. And she's sitting there, and she's, all of a sudden she stops herself. She goes, wait a minute. I said, what? She goes, I just recited a whole entire passage from 1 Peter to you, and I don't even have my Bible with me. I'm like, that's awesome, man. It's in your head. Wherever you go, then, you just can think on it. You can pull it up at any time. How much stuff do we do that it's just, you know, muscle memory? We can just sit and think about something else, driving in the car, whatever else you're doing. You can constantly be meditating on the Word of God. Let it drain over your soul. You see, that way, when things come, and pshoo, pshoo, you know, it's like I tell my kids, there's a proverb for that. <laughs> Regardless of the time of the day or the context, the godly respond to life in accordance with God's word. We do this because it's in us. 
Meditation is the act of the righteous that focus on the law, the Lord himself, and the works and deeds of the Lord. Notice these passages, Psalm 63, 6. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. How many of us do that? How many, how many of us stay awake at night laying in bed just thinking about God? I meditate on you. How many sleepless nights have we had meditating on God? How many sleepless nights have we had meditating on the bills that aren't going to get paid? See the difference? Psalm 119, verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. I shall lift up my hands to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. May the arrogant be ashamed, for they subvert me with a lie, but I, in contrast to their lie, but I shall meditate on your precepts. It's that constant digestion, but it's that thing that you delight in. It is that thing that you have a passion for. It is that thing that you love. How I love your law. The law. Think about it. The law. How I love your law. Yes? Is my meditation all the day. The law. <laughs> See, the law. Seriously. I mean, think about it. This is what I love. The law of God. Thou shalt not. Thou shalt. Yeah, I can think of a whole lot of other things to love, but law? But see, it's God's law. It's His revealed will. It's Him revealing Himself to us. Remember I said before, you cannot separate the law from God Himself, His personal being. It is an expression of Him, His nature. This is how we have a relationship with Him. I ask people, how's your relationship with God? I don't know. Well, how, how often do you read your Bible? Not very often. Well, then I'll answer your question for you. Not very good. Yes? Not very good. And I'm not trying to be jerky, but I have to say the same thing to myself. I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. All the day. There's so many things that preoccupy our minds. The alternation from the perfect tense to the imperfect. He moves from perfect tense in verse 1 to imperfect verse 2 to highlight the habitual aspect of this meditation. He's constantly doing this. So he makes it very clear, not only by the tense, but also by the reference to day and night. This is a constant endeavor for me. The righteous meditate not only for the purpose of encouragement, but also for their life that may actually conform to the object of their meditation, conform to God, conform to His law. There are so many times that the Word of God can bring such enrichment to our lives. I remind myself of this passage so often, and I read through this psalm. Psalm 119, verse 25 and following. My soul cleaves to the dust. I'm just telling you, you can't get any lower than that. My soul cleaves to the dust. Revive me according to what? According to your Word. I have told of my ways and you have answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts. So I will meditate on your wonders. My soul weeps because of grief. Strengthen me according to what? According to your word. Remove the false way from me and graciously grant me your law. I have chosen the faithful way. I have placed your ordinances before me. I cling to your testimonies. O oh Lord, do not put me to shame. I shall run the way of your commandments, for you will enlarge my heart. Listen to me. I, it may sound really simplistic, but I absolutely believe in the sufficiency of the Word of God. I just do. And listen to me. When, when dealing with people in the world, i got nothing else to offer you. I just don't. I'm an idiot. I'm not very smart. I don't have a whole lot of ingenuity. If I can give you anything in life to help you out of anything, it is solely this. It's this. It's all I got. So when people come to counseling and, and they ask me, well, give me something, and I go straight to the Word. I did, that's where I have to go. 
And then they say, well, I don't want that. Well, I'm sorry, then I've got nothing left to say. I'm sorry. That's all I got. But see, it's because I believe that's all, all I need. I just believe that. I believe that my soul can cleave to the dust and His Word can revive me. I absolutely believe that. 100% I believe that. Why? Because there's been so many times in my life where I have been grieving and there is no one that can console me. And I've gone this to this Word every time and He has lifted me out of despair. And I know it can do the same for you. And Joshua says this, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. The zealous study and meditation of the law results in being filled with the will of Yahweh and then of doing His commandments. And it ultimately comes down to walking in obedience. The light that is talked about here is not merely in just knowing, studying, or memorizing the Word of God, but especially of doing God's will, rather than being deceived by the wicked. And see, what does the Lord say? If you love me, you'll do what? You will keep my commandments. We're going through Colossians, bracketing the statement, so that you will walk in a manner pleasing, uh, worthy of the Lord, pleasing Him in everything, everything. What brackets that is two statements on knowing, knowing His will. It's the only way I can please Him. I realized that on the mission trip in, in England and, and surrounded by a bunch of strangers, I didn't really know anybody. And here I am in a foreign land and foreign churches we're visiting. And, and here I am with a group of people I'm serving with and I, I don't know them that well. And I just, all of a sudden, man, I just had this realization, I've got God and His Word. And I've never forgot that moment of what it did to my soul to realize that wherever I go in this world, I could be surrounded by a million strangers, but so long as I have this, I'm good. I'm good. Psalm 119 says, I am a pilgrim in the earth. Please do not take your commandments from me. This is my constant prayer to God. I am a pilgrim in this place. Please don't take this from me. Because without it, I got nothing. I got nothing. I got no direction. I've got no counselors. I've got no vision. I've got no understanding. I have no knowledge. I have no hope. I have no truth. Sola Scriptura is not just a couple of words. It's a way of life. The permanence of the tree, we'll walk through this. You can read this on your own, the fruitfulness of it. The impermanence of the chaff, I mean, the contrast is clear, that he will be like a tree firmly planted in streams of water. And this is awesome because he's not talking about a tree in the dry wadis or, or one planted where it gets occasional rain. He is talking one that is strategically planted by irrigation canals. And notice the plural form. By the streams or canals of water. This is a tree that is getting fed constantly. Therefore, look at it. It yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither, and whatever it does, it prospers. This is the one who is constantly drinking in the Word of God. The contrast to that is stark. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. So when they're dealing with the wheat, right, they have these wicker baskets, sort of like half little dome things, and they go out there up on a hillside and they'll take the wheat and they'll throw it on top of this thing and they'll sift it. And then they'll toss it in the air. And when they sift it and toss it in the air, the wind will blow and the chaff will get blown away and they'll have the kernel. That tells you how worthless that chaff is. There's nothing of any importance or sustenance in it at all. It's just gone, vapor. Picture's clear. If you're in the Word, this is your life. If you're not, this is your life. Let 
And how different the course and the end of their life, the brevity of the wicked's description stands in stark contrast to the fuller portrayal of the righteous, a tree with leaves and fruit brings edification to others. The futility of life that yields nothing more than substantial than useless remains scattered. The metaphor not only reveals the uselessness of the wicked, but also the ease with which God will deal with them. He is a discriminating God. There will be no standing then in the place of the righteous. And the contrast is clear. In the way of the perishing, their future destiny, they will not be in the presence of the Lord. I just tell you, this is one of the Psalms I am constantly going back to. And I would suggest to do the same for yours if in your life you are starting to lose perspective. When all of the options out there, there's so many voices calling out to us. There's so many detours. There's so many things vying for our attention. Sometimes we need to stop and center ourselves, right? Get ourselves focused. I always come back to this psalm because it sets me on the course right. And it sets the things that are of utmost importance in life. A relationship with God and that comes through His Word. I must delight it. I must have passion for it. I must love it. And I've got to be in it all the time. If I am, fruitful. If I'm not, not. It's that simple. And all of the complexity that goes on in our lives, it is that simple. May God help us as we seek to stay on course. Because in the end, we want to reach that final hallelujah. Yes, we want to be among all the righteous. And we want to be there at the end when all of creation is going to rejoice in the presence of God and worship Him. May God help us to stay the course. Let's pray.